Thank you, Madam Clerk. I'll call this uh, Committee of the Whole meeting to order at this time. Uh, thank you to everybody for joining us. I'm Councillor Prinzen from Bloomfield Hallowell. So I'd like to welcome the public, my fellow council members, the media, and anyone who is joining us electronically and in person for this Committee of the Whole meeting. Today's Committee of the Whole is meeting in a physically distant manner at the Highline Hall in Wellington and District Community Center. I appreciate your patience and cooperation as we navigate this time of uncertainty. I will remind you that the May 24th Council meeting and the May 26th Committee of the Whole meetings will only be virtual due to the provincial election. Today's agenda lists all of the items before committee for consideration. The recommended motions on today's agenda are shown in boldface. Copies of the agenda have been posted on the county's website. This meeting is being live streamed and any participation in the meeting proceedings will become part of the public record. The recording from the meeting will be published on the county's website immediately and can be viewed by selecting live stream meetings on the bottom right of the county's homepage at thecounty.on.ca. Under agenda item five, I will be asking for comments from the audience. Members of the public who wish to provide comments at future meetings can do so by contacting clerks at pecounty.on.ca to register. Today we have one registered comment from the audience. A reminder that if you participate, your name will be included in the committee minutes and form part of the public record and posted to the county's website. Any motion made at this meeting is not final until the council meeting of May 24, 2022, at which time the council may approve, amend, defer, or otherwise change the motion made by this committee. In the event of a fire, please use the applicable exits in the Highline Hall or wherever you are tuning in from. For those at Highline Hall, please mute and limit use of cell phones. And that could go for those online too. So at this time, I will look to, to the committee for a confirmation of the agenda. Councillor McMahon, seconded by Councillor Harper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is McMahon. Harper motion that the agenda for the Committee of the Whole meeting May the 12, 2022 be confirmed. All in favor? And that carries. Uh, to close your pecuniary interest in the general nature thereof, is there anybody who has anything to declare? Councillor Harper? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a conflict on 6.1 as I am a owner of an STA. Thank you, Councillor Harper. Does anybody else have anything they would like to declare today? Seeing nothing, I will move on to number four, deputations. So we have one deputation for today's meeting, it's Elspeth Domville, the chair of the Friends of the Wellington Heritage Committee, to address the committee regarding designation, designating the Wellington Heritage Museum a project of community interest. So welcome, welcome today, and you have 10 minutes to give your deputation. Thank you. Um, to the chair and to the committee, uh, my name is Elspeth Domville, and I'm the chair of the Friends of the Wellington Heritage Museum. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm here on behalf of the Friends to ask that you designate the Wellington Museum a project of community interest. This will allow us to establish a separate fund for the museum under the auspices of County Museums and the Director of Finance, Amanda Carter. It will allow for the issuing of tax receipts by the county for donations made specifically to the Wellington Museum. We've been working together over the last few months with Shire Hall staff on this. They've recognized our commitment to the museum and are wholly supportive of this initiative. We thank them for the time they've spent and for their guidance. We've also discussed this with Wellington Councillor Mike Harper and he too is very supportive. At our recent AGM, the Friends voted unanimously in favor of pursuing this designation, and several members are here today in a further demonstration of their support. I'd like to offer you a brief, a brief bit of background to the museum site and the Friends group so that you have some context as you consider this. The building began its life in 1885 as a meeting house for the Society of Friends, also known as the Quakers, who were enormously influential in the development of this area. In the late 1960s, the Quakers gifted ownership of the building to the village on the understanding that it served the community and operate as a museum in perpetuity. The Friends Group has been in existence for decades since, fulfilling this wish by supporting and promoting local history to county residents and to tourists. 
Our most recent project was the creation of a heritage garden behind the museum building, which I know that several of you supported. What was until four years ago an empty lawn is now filled with indigenous plants, unique benches, fully accessible walkways, and an entertainment area. The focal point is a large sculpture by the renowned Canadian sculptor Philippe Palafray. The garden has already played host to a number of events, such as the Big Lake Festival, children's art classes, several history-based presentations, and during the pandemic, a Halloween pumpkin walkabout. It's been successful beyond any of our expectations, and it's become a very special place in our village. What's inspired our request for the Project of Community Interest designation is our desire to build on that success, and we are now turning our attention to the interior overhaul. We're planning an ambitious fundraising campaign and being able to offer tax receipts to donors and in an expeditious way is absolutely critical. Our inaugural effort is a fundraiser cocktail party and silent auction, which will be held in the museum garden on June 11th this year. At that event, we will officially launch a $100,000 capital campaign project, and we are committed to raising these funds over the next two to three years. We have two goals in mind for this money, both of which we will believe will have a tremendous impact on the residents of this municipality. One is to reimagine the space as being able to serve two distinct functions. It will remain primarily a home to museum exhibitions, but will be planned in such a way as it can quickly pivot into a more open environment for community events of all kinds. Things such as film screenings, art shows, lectures, literary events, social gatherings for the community, as well as special events such as weddings and life celebrations. Funds raised through the capital campaign will go towards the design and building of several museum quality mobile display units which will beautifully showcase artifacts, but which can be quickly rolled to the sides when the space is needed for an event. Other items would include, but not necessarily limited to, various digital interpretive elements, a digital projector, and an AV system, among other things. Our second goal is to ensure that funds are in place to mount high quality exhibitions well into the future. We realize that these are ambitious goals, but we're confident that they can be realized and within our time frame. I say this because the talent pool that is the Friends of the Wellington Heritage Museum is truly a dream team of very passionate professional area residents who volunteered a tremendous amount of their time already to this museum and feel very heavily invested in its future. Beyond that, we enjoy a lot of support from members of our community. And the proof is in the pudding, as they say, we were able to fundraise well over $50,000 for the creation of the museum garden alone. With the great support already expressed to us from many, many residents of the county and some beyond our borders, we are now embarking on those new goals. To achieve them, it's essential that we are able to issue tax receipts, and so we ask for your approval of our request to be designated as a project of community interest. And we thank you for your time today, listening to and considering this important request. Thank you. Thank you very much for your deputation. I will turn to the committee for some questions. Councillor Harper. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Elizabeth. Um, yes, uh, I am a big fan of this. Um, I think the Friends of Museum have done a great job um, in the past, and. Um, I mean, what we're largely talking about here is a, a capital project, and it would be great to have a capital project um, that's not on the broad tax base. And uh, so I see this initiative as fulfilling that, so it's, uh, uh, it's uh, doubly beneficial. Um, just wanted to clarify, Elspeth, on the, on the 100, um, because you do mention about capital project. So for purposes of today, we're going to need to have a little amendment to, to get this rolling. So is this largely, we're trying to zero in on exactly what is the community interest. Would you say it is mostly the capital improvement and that that's primary uh, uh, head and shoulders above putting on future exhibits? We just have to sort out how we would find the right language to, to make this all um, hunky-dory with, with our clerk who is uh, very specific about how it needs to be written here. So, uh, I would say that certainly the um, um, 
the, the emphasis is on the capital campaign for the building. Um, we do already have, um, well beyond what we fundraised for the garden, we do already have quite a bit of money that we've um, raised that, we'll, that we can use for future exhibits. Of course, if we don't have an improved interior, uh, we won't have such terrific exhibits. So certainly, our big push is on the um, capital improvements to the property. Okay, thank you. So I'll leave that and I'll have an amendment after others have had a chance to uh, ask some questions. Perfect, thank you. Is there any other questions? Councilor McNaughton? Thank you, not a question, more just a thank you very much to the Friends Group because uh, they, as a representative of the Museum Advisory Board, they provide a lot of um, productive uh, assistance for um, efforts revolving around the museum. So always grateful for their effort, thanks. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any further comments before I go back to Councillor Harper? Not seeing any, Councillor Harper, the floor is yours. Okay, so I'm just gonna look to uh, Madam Clerk, I sent you something, does that work for you based on what you heard? Or do you wanna tweak it? Through the chair, uh, it does work and I, would you like to read it out loud? Yeah, I'll read it out loud, sure. Okay, so we would, um, we would receive the report and then the addition would be as follows. The committee approved the Friends of the Wellington Heritage Museum proposed initiative to become a project of community interest and that their organization enter into a partnership agreement with the county. Okay, can I get a seconder on Councillor Margaretson? Thank you. So is that, is that uh, Councillor Harper's amendment clear to the committee? Uh, Madam CAO? Uh, through the chair to uh, Councillor Harper, I think it might be better if it said that it was uh, a project of community interest for capital improvements to the Wellington Museum, uh, just to be clear where this money would go, because the way this is structured right now, it would be staff in collaboration with the friends making the decisions of where that money gets spent. Uh, it would not be coming back to council because we're clear on the location. So I think just being clear on the intent of that money, um, following up on the question and answer that happened before you brought the motion would be better. So I'd add the words, something to the effect of uh, for capital improvements to the Wellington Museum. Madam Clerk, you got, that, I'll take that as a friendly amendment to or advice from the CAO to Councillor Harper, who's not in, in agreement, so we're all good. Uh, any further comments on the amendment? Do you want me to read it? You, Madam Clerk, would you please read that? Certainly, through the chair. That committee approved the Friends of Wellington Heritage Museum capital campaign improvements to the Wellington Heritage Museum to become a project of community interest, and that the Friends of the Wellington Heritage Museum enter into a partnership agreement with the county. Thank you very much. I'll call the vote on the amendment. All in favor? And that carries. Now I will go back to the original motion as amended. And I'll assume we have Councillor Harper and Margaretson still on that. So all in favor? And that carries too. Thank you very much you. for coming today. And the county looks forward to working with the Wellington Museum group. And thanks for all your work. All right, at, that's all for our deputation. So at this time, we have one registered comment from the audience. And I, I'll make the assumption, since there's no other audience, that we only have one. So uh, today, Matt Pennick regarding short-term accommodation licensing changes, will be joining us in making a... Madam Clerk, uh, would you please read that? Matt, can you please turn off your YouTube? I did, yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, welcome to our committee meeting today. I'll remind you, you have three minutes and you're welcome to start whenever you're ready. Okay, let me just get this minimized here. Okay. Good afternoon, members of the committee and county staff, and thank you for giving me the time to speak today. My name is Matt Pennock and I'm a board member of the licensed short-term accommodators of Prince Edward County. I'm a county resident and my family and I have resided here for going on 30 years and I currently own and operate a local construction company. First off, I would like to commend you on the work that has been done thus far in the STA licensing program. We know it hasn't been an easy task, but at least we think we're in the home stretch. 
And this brings me to our points for comment. Our first comment would be regarding only allowing the natural persons to own an STA. In this cli current climate of sue first and ask questions later, there are many operators who would choose to hold an STA in the name of a corporation for a number of reasons, including protecting themselves from being personally liable if an accident were to happen on said property. Being a business owner myself, I am well aware of the personal liability that can arise if a business is in a personal name and that person is sued, as I'm sure many of you are well aware. It's only fair to allow people to protect themselves and mitigate risk. In addition, more people work from home these days, so their principal residence could be under the name of a corporation while they use a portion of it as a STA to make ends meet. If the county's concern is to have that cap of one STA per license owner occupied residence, whether it's in a person's name or a corporate name, then we should create a bylaw for that reason. Uh, to seem to, uh, to go to restrict a person from using their own property in the name that they may choose seems like an overreach of personal rights. We also wanted to address the fines imposed on STA owners who do not comply with stating their STA license on their advertising. The fines of 1,000, 2,000, and 4,000 are the same for licensed STAs as unlicensed STAs. A thousand dollar fine to a licensed operator for a potential admin error of not posting a license seems excessive. After all, why wouldn't a licensed operator want to, their license on an advertisement? We as licensed operators are the ones who are following the rules and have been for many years. Is the county trying to catch on licensed operators by asking for the license numbers to be on STA advertising? If so, what resources have been put towards catching the offenders? Shouldn't the fines imposed for SC unlicensed STAs be much harsher? Maybe the fines should be 10,000, 25,000, and 50,000 for unlicensed offenders. We would assume that most unlicensed operators would look at the one, two, or $4,000 fines just as a cost of doing business and would carry on fully booked for an entire season. We would suggest that the licensed operators only be giving a warning for the first offense and a fine of 100 or 500 for subsequent license number offenses. What is the timeline for requesting license numbers be included on advertising? Has the county given platforms like Airbnb who hosts 66% of the vacation rentals in the county enough time to create a new field to accommodate this request. They already did so in Toronto. This STA program has been operating for three plus years now and we still haven't seen anything with any teeth to seek and out and go after unlicensed operators. What we need is a system of punishments which are fair and effective at modifying offending behaviors. We ask that you tweak some of the bylaws so that they make sense and treat law-abiding operators in a fair, equal, and just manner. Thank you. Gonna guess you practiced that because you were bang on three minutes. So very well done. <laughs> yeah, there was there was a lot of content, so I was trying to minimize very it as very much, much appreciated by the committee. That's for sure. Uh, I will just hold right there. If there may be a few yep. questions, Councilor sure. McNaughton, did you have a question? I, I did, yes, because uh, this was sort of an area of interest for me, too, is th the d discrepancy of, or the similarity of fines for behaviors that we're certainly looking to dissuade and some that are just like maybe a clerical area, error. And I wanted uh, to hear, I, it just went, went by me quickly. What were you proposing for failure to display SDA license numbers? Did you our sorry our proposal for licensed operators would simply be a warning a first time warning and then a hundred dollar for a five hundred dollar fine on consecutive warnings because okay. our thought really is there'd be no reason why an unlicensed why a licensed operator wouldn't want to have their license number on an advertisement right and then beefing up fines for people who are operating without a license for sure. Okay, that's very similar to the notes that uh, that I had. Thank you. Um, slight differences in amounts, but I don't think. You good? Yeah, thank you very much. Are there any further questions? Not seeing any, so thanks again for coming today Perfect. and uh, thank you sharing for your the comments. Time. Thank you. Could I get a mover and a seconder, please, to receive Councillor Nyman? Councillor McMahon? Nyman McMahon motion that uh, comments from the audience be received. Thank you, Councillor Nyman. All in favor? And that carries. Okay, moving on to 
The items for consideration on the agenda today, so 6.1, which is a report of the Community Services Programs and Initiative Department dated May 12, 2022, regarding recommendation for short-term short accommodation licensing changes. So Emily's here. I'm going to have her give us a, there's a lot of, lot of details in this report. I'm going to have her give us a, a brief overview before we open it up to questions. So Emily, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Through you to committee, uh, it is a fairly complicated report. Um, we, we tried to keep it as clear as possible. We also tried to really stick with the recommendations brought forward by Council at Committee of the Whole on March 10th, uh, which are listed at the beginning of the report in the analysis section. Uh, basically, staff are recommending a cap of zero on all future STA licenses except for owner-occupied STAs, uh, those that operate STAs in their primary residence, uh, and fully accessible STAs as whole home STAs, uh, giving up to three act or having up to three active licenses at any time period, uh, and those accessible STAs could not operate in an R3 or R4 zone. Uh, staff are also recommending that the natural persons requirement in all new uh, STA licenses um, is in the new bylaw. We're also bringing forward uh, zoning bylaw amendments to committee to encompass previous discussions that we had uh, regarding removing STA provisions from the zoning bylaw and putting them into the STA bylaw. So all of the uh, STA licensing provi provisions that are currently in the zoning bylaw that don't actually have anything to do with land use can be removed and put into the STA licensing bylaw and therefore not be affected by grandfathering going forward. Uh, that was discussed at a previous meeting uh, and approved, and so this is sort of the, the paperwork of uh, the amended bylaw going to a planning committee meeting on June 15th, because all changes to the zoning bylaw need to have a statutory public meeting. So uh, the just those changes to the zoning bylaw, the removal of everything to do with STAs that don't touch on land use planning, uh, we're asking that they be removed from the zoning bylaw and put into the STA bylaw. So that's what the June 15th planning meeting is about. Um, we are also going to um, update the administrative penalty bylaw for failure to post STA license numbers on any STA advertisement. Um, and once these motions today are carried, including any amending motions that may be made today or omissions, um, that will be um, available to the public to look at, we'll uh, likely consult with stakeholders again so that these draft bylaws are available for everyone to look at to make sure we don't have any unintended consequences with hopefully this last round of changes to the STA bylaw uh, and then it will come back to council for, um, for ratification. I thought it was probably almost as confusing as that uh, long report but I'm ready to answer any questions if you have any. All good, thank you very much. I will look to the committee for questions. Councilor McNaughton. Thank you, just, just out of the gate, just for clarification, you mentioned owner occupied, but you mean primary residence. Can we, dis can we make sure that all do distinguishing definitions or um, titling happens appropriately so that we don't uh, have any confusion because now we're looking at primary resident whole home rentals and owner occupied primary resident there's still sort of um, an opportunity to do both as long as you're a primary resident we will make sure that if it isn't already clear in between the owner occupied definition and the whole home definition that owner occupied means that the residents are in residence and are living there while they are providing accommodation on that same property. Thank you, yes, and fully supervised, okay. yes. presumably. You never know. Um, may you got, I? You got another question? Or? Yeah. Go ahead with another one, then we'll look around for more. So, thank you. So, uh, my key concerns, as you outlined, were those unintended consequences of primary res on primary residents. There were a number of things I was hoping to see, and I understand the limits, and they're very well laid out. Um, and the challenges with the existing enforcement makes it difficult to even conceive of another opportunity for uh, primary residents of the county to, to do something on a much scaled down version. So I understand. I, I might not be happy 
uh, you know, that, that we can't offer that at this time, but I do understand and I appreciate the, the, um, the rationale provided. So I did, one of the things I did note was uh, similar to what the um, commenter noted, which is uh, I, I don't necessarily find the penalty structure to be uh, within, within um, the framework permitted. Where would be the right opportunity to look at how, how to fine tune those amounts so that we're dissuading what we're really trying to dissuade and simply reminding if there's a clerical issue. Is that conversation, should we be looking at total numbers now or should we be, should this be part of the consultation that goes out? And, uh, and I do understand that there are some limits as to the, the fines that we can place um, without looking at a different penalty structure. Uh, and I was wondering if you could sort of uh, elaborate if, if that is correct or not. Uh, through the Emily? chair yep. to Councilor McNaughton. Uh, so we will be taking conversations from this meeting uh, as well as any other stakeholder and, and public comments that happen in between and coming back with what we feel is, is a, a consensus to change um, the administrative penalties. Uh, I. I agree actually with the, um, with the person who made the comment that uh, perhaps a smaller fine for those who have just made a mistake and have a license but didn't get it posted. Um, there's still a cost to us doing the work to look through the platforms and to find uh, numbers or not as the case may be. So maybe a, a 50, 100, $200 fine. Um, and really what we're trying to stop is people advertising uh, SDAs that are not licensed. So uh, a larger fine where possible, and we can find out what our upper limits are and, and do a bit more of an environmental scan about what other fines are out there, and we can bring that back. Um, we can add that as part of our, of our consultation. And then Thank come back with an amended bylaw based on this conversation at that council meeting. Okay. So, so we don't need to start talking numbers now. We can wait and see it because we could go all over the board. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hirsch? Thank you, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> and thanks, Emily. This is um, this is quite a work that uh, that you folks presented us with today. It took at least two reads to uh, to fully comprehend it, and I I commend you and your staff for all the work that's gone into this. As Mr. Panic said in his comments, we're we're into the final stretch here, and um, and and getting really close. I just like to um, confirm that I agree with Councillor McNaughton's view that that some work perhaps needs to be done on the. The fines. I understand you're taking that under advisement uh, going forward to the uh, public sessions. So I would also ask you then, um, uh, Emily, do you have an, uh, an opinion or any thought on the insurance question that Mr. Panic also raised? The uh, the uh, the suggestion that uh, liabilities were different uh, for um, uh, natural persons versus a uh, number of corporations. Emily, through you, Chair, to Councillor Hirsch. Um, there are obvious um, benefits to uh, being a, structured as a corporation in terms of liability. <coughs> I'm not an insurance expert, but I know that to be true. Uh, however, I feel that the rest of the um, provisions that we are looking to add to the STA bylaw somewhat negate the issue altogether if we are not providing new licenses or new whole home licenses then I'm, maybe it's a moot point to worry if they're natural persons or corporations because um, whole home STAs uh, are, are empty of the responsible person and um, uh, owner-occupied SDAs have that responsible person living and on site, but we will have a little bit more of a deep dive into the insurance ramifications of corporations versus uh, private owners or personal owners. Uh, we did put this through our legal channels and there didn't seem to be any, any problem with making it just natural persons, uh, but we will have a bit of a deeper dive just to understand what, the, um, what any uh, consequences might be from just making it natural persons. That's great, thank you. Thank you, Emily and uh, Councillor Nyman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to make sure I understand, Emily, because I thought you said if this was passed, 
today, um, you would take it away and, and it, it wouldn't come back to council. But I'm just wondering about the fines and stuff. If you're changing the fines, does that not come back to council? I just want to understand it a bit. Through you, Chair, to Councillor Diamond. So it, it will come back to you. So we've shown you the draft bylaws today so you can understand the changes that we want to make, make and how they look in the bylaw. Uh, anything that's changed in today's um, meeting or in SDA consultations uh, will be reflected in, in any more research that staff do about any of the questions that we've heard today will come back to Council uh, before those bylaws are ratified. They have okay. to be ratified by council, so council will have to agree. Yeah, okay, thank you. <coughs> Councillor Margotson. Thank you. <laughs> Just um, following up further on the liability issue of natural persons versus corporations, and it's my feeling that with the licensing regime and the municipality imposing standards and issuing licenses, that we wouldn't be involved in any liability as well, and there would be less ex or it would be a shared exposure and so that doesn't concern me that much but I was just going to ask you Emily through the chair so once a corporation divests only a natural person could bring that license back on board and what if uh, one a natural person buys all that corporation's asset say multiple multiple STAs To you, Emily. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Through you, Chair, to Councillor Margotson. Thank you for that question. <laughs> um, we have had these discussions. Uh, it's been a bit cyclical in, uh, in trying to find a response to them. Um, we will likely, we've been talking to our legal counterparts. Likely we'll talk to our insurance counter counterparts as well because I think they both go hand in hand. But um, if we are not issuing any new whole home SDA licenses, I'm not sure how deep we need to go in that regard. So I think the question about divesting a corporation is the question that we need to find an answer to and make sure that we have that covered in our uh, bylaw coming back. That's the only one that I'm just, I'm not 100% sure how that will affect their eligibility. Follow up. You follow up, go ahead. Thank you. Yes, but if, if they do sell, you can relicense that, that one. Not new ones, these are existing ones. That was my point, not, right. not new ones, okay. Emily, but you I, got a comment? I, I would leave that with you, Emily, that, that question, comment. Do you want any more to add or are you just taking it? Through the chair, I should just take that and walk away, but I am going to say to you <laughs> that um, a grandfathered STA, uh, when it's sold, can legally still be used as an STA because it's uh, rooted in the zoning bylaw. The However, one. the STA eligibility provisions are now in the STA bylaw or will be in the STA bylaw. So there are other eligibility provisions in there that the new owner may or may not comply with, including density and other restrictions. So it's not a direct relicense. Thank you. Councillor Bullock? This isn't an easy one, Emily. Um, those of us who sit on planning, or all of us who sit on planning, know how complex some of those questions are. So just for those listening who may not be up on that, can you just uh, talk about the significance of R3 and R4 zones? Emily? Through you, Chair, to Councillor Bolick, absolutely. So, um, and I'm casting my mind back to our previous report, which discussed this a little bit. Uh, R3 zone is for uh, mixed type housing. So you have townhouses, um, apartments, semi-detached, detached, triplexes. Uh, these are considered to be, correct me if I'm wrong, these are considered to be uh, more uh, affordable and attainable housing. Uh, a lot of new housing that is being developed uh, are in R4 zones. So we're trying to protect these more affordable and attainable housing types from being used as uh, short-term accommodations. And R4 is our newest zone introduced uh, a few months ago, I believe, uh, with smaller setbacks and um, uh, other provisions that make it easier to build on a smaller lot. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Bailey. Thank you, Chair. Emily, thank you for this great report. Um, Mr. Pennick brought up something earlier that I had in mind. When it comes to fines, be it for current SCA owners or for the people who are, at, are advertising without a license, how are they administered and enforced? And do we have enough staff or the facility to do that? Emily. Through you, Chair, to Councillor Bailey, uh, we are in the final stages of uh, acquiring a, or procuring, I should say, uh, SDA compliance software. So a lot of the work to find advertised uh, STAs that are not licensed uh, will happen in a sort of a desktop manner, which really helps with our resources. So there's a there's, I've got uh, the CAO with her hand up, and I'm not sure if I should just stop now and see if you want to clarify something. Oh, I'll flip it to the no, CAO then. Uh, Madam CAO, chair, go ahead. Through the chair to <coughs> Councillor Bailey, I just wanted to recognize that we have Director McNichol here who is responsible for enforcement, and we've made some recent hires, and I think he can speak. Uh, it's probably more fair that he be asked to that question. So it looks like we have another deferral. Councillor Mc <laughs> er, Council Director McNichol, sorry about that. <laughs> Didn't want you to bring you down to our level. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> uh, through the through the chair to uh, to the committee. Yes, absolutely. As uh, as uh, Director Cowan had mentioned, we uh, we are in the process of uh, reviewing a tender that did go out for uh, for software that will help help us take a proactive look um, at uh, capturing some of these individuals that are operating without a license. Um, and it will be a, a fair bit easier than doing that uh, from a labor perspective. Uh, we've also made a number of changes within the organizational structure of the bylaw department, STA. We now have a bylaw coordinator and we do have a couple additional staff. So on an organizational level, um, we're, we're developing some efficiencies. Uh, and in addition, when you add the, the new software to the process, uh, I think we should have enough staff and we should be structured appropriately uh, in order to take this on. Thank you very much. Follow up, Councillor Bailey. Just a quick one. Thank you, Aaron. Um, with that in mind, you mentioned capturing individuals without a license. Uh, are we working on what we can do about them? In other words, what Mr. Pennock suggested, more onerous fines. Uh, th through the chair to Councillor Bailey, yes, absolutely. And I think Emily had mentioned, or Director Cowan had mentioned earlier, uh, that we're looking at revising the, the, the fines and perhaps uh, having steeper fines for those individuals that, that are, are, are captured um, in this manner. And then even perhaps having it tiered where the first, uh, the first fine would be X amount and the next fine would be perhaps double and then so on and so forth. So uh, we are looking at that for, for when we revise the, the, the next bylaw. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. I think there's a lot of head nodding going on in the fine, so that we'll take. I think Emily sees it too, so we'll take that. They'll take that back. Uh, Councillor Maynard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just had some uh, questions, or maybe for further, uh, for some further consideration, is how we are going to um, prove principal residency, and also regarding. Um, for principal resident for a new license, but also uh, looking for information regarding grandfathering. So when I look at the at the uh, you know the the list, I mean there's some things like you know I have affordable rental housing, but I have a utility bill in my name. I certainly have a um, municipal tax notice and several of those uh, those others. But, uh, and even the, uh, your notice of assessment from uh, Revenue Canada does not necessarily, does not show your statement of rental income. So I would just like to see if you could have a little uh, deeper dive on how we can actually, um, you know, like a full income tax return would show whether you had been uh, claiming rental on that property. And, uh, but I don't, uh, I don't see enough in the, in the listing to actually prove that it is your principal residency and that uh, or that that you have indeed uh, been um, are eligible for for grandfathering and if you've never claimed any income off of it then obviously you haven't been uh, haven't been uh, renting it so in comment if you'd like but I would like to have uh, have a little more um, 
have you have a little closer look at that uh, list of how we are going to determine principal residency. Director Cowan, do you want to add a comment? Uh, through you, the chair, I'll just say that we will we'll take that under advisement. We did have a, a pretty thorough conversation about it with bylaw, but we can certainly see if we can hone that a bit more to to make sure that we can have it um, have it proven to be the uh, primary resident. So we'll we'll take it back and, and see if we can find some better ways. Thank you. Is there any further comments on 6.1? Yeah, I just I just realized something, comes McMahon. I don't think I ever put this on the floor, and we've commented all these things. So would you like to put it on the floor for me, since your hand is up? <laughs> I will do that. Thank you. Can all I get right. a seconder, Why Councilor Saint Jean? I do that first? Sorry okay. about that, Madam Clerk. Need a seconder. Get okay. Saint Jean. All right. Uh, McMahon Saint Jean motion that Council receive report CSP 13 2022 that Council direct staff to amend the 108. Dash 2021 bylaw to license, regulate, and govern the operation of short term accommodation dwelling rentals in the county of Prince Edward to include a, a natural person requirement on all new SBA licenses issued, and b, a cap of zero on the issuance of future SBA licenses with primary residence and accessibility exemptions for properties that are not found in R3 or R4 zones. Three, that council directs staff to amend the County of Prince Edward zoning bylaw to A, remove exemptions for STAs found in R3 zones. Four, that council directs staff to amend the 4519-2019 bylaw to establish a system of administration penalties for non-compliance with bylaws of the County of Prince Edward to A, include penalties and failure for failure to post STA license numbers on any STA advertisement and five, that council directs staff to bring these changes forward to the public for final comment and returning to council on June the 21st, 2022 with amended, most, uh, with amended zoning and STA licensing bylaws. Thank you, Councillor McMahon. I hope you saved some words for your comment on that now. Do you I, remember? I, I kind of have. All right. Okay. Uh, to you. Quick question. Um, before it comes back to council on the 21st of June, I think that's what I read, yeah. Um, is there any further public consultation on this? I, I, you may have said it and I, it went over my head, so I'm asking again, because sen sometimes do fly. Through, Director Cowan. Through you, Chair, to Council McMahon. So the um, removal of the STA provisions from the zoning bylaw will be at a, a public planning meeting and all the statutory uh, advertisements will be done. And we will have, as soon as this meeting and its um, carried motions are ratified at the next council meeting, we will make sure that the bylaw, uh, draft bylaw that we put, uh, we'll put it on the Have Your Say page to have people look through, comment on uh, what they think might be unintended consequences, but maybe have a conversation around uh, administrative penalties and fines. Uh, and we will likely have a, a stakeholder consultation uh, with SDA owners as well and then bring it back. Okay, good enough, thank you. Thank you for that. Any further comments? Not seeing any, I will call the vote. All in favor? And that carries. Thank you very much. 6.2, could I get a mover, Councillor St. Jean, and a seconder, Councillor Nyman? Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's a St. Jean Nyman motion. The council report rec receive report CLS 16-2022 that council rescind the following policies. Attachment two, IT 100 information technologies and internet use policy. IT 300 council computer purchase policy. FI 200 check signing authority general. FI 2210, check signing authority mechanical reproduction of signatures. FI 270, purchasing policy. FI 290, tax deferral program for low income seniors and persons with disabilities. FI 300, tax rebates for charitable organizations. And three, that council approve the following draft policies. CSPI 01, information technology security policy, CSPI 02, information technology acceptable use policy, 
FIN 02 investment policy, FIN 03 debt policy, FIN 04 corporate sponsorship of county assets policy, FIN 05 cash handling policy, FIN 06 property tax administration policy, FIN 07 financing signing authority, financial signing authority, sorry, uh, FIN 08 donations policy, FIN 09 community grant program policy, FIN 10 reserve and reserve fund policy, FIN 11 commodity price hedging policy, and four that council direct staff to complete the <coughs> review of bylaw 3183-2013 being a bylaw to establish procedures for the sale or disposition of land and FI 400 sale or disposition of land policy in Q2 of 2023. Thank you, Councillor St. Jean. Uh, Anne, I see you're the author of the report. I will turn the floor to you if you have any comments that you would like to add before we ask questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if, with your permission, I'm going to uh, ask Aaron, our director, to provide an overview of the project. Permission granted. Director McNichol. Uh, through the chair to, uh, to members of council. Um, so this is uh, uh, by, this is in part, this report is in part uh, related to the bylaw and policy review project. Um, it's, uh, it's currently being led by the clerk's office and myself. And the project started back in 2020 uh, when there were some consultants hired um, where they did some comparisons between um, other municipalities that are similar structured uh, to us uh, preparing the bylaws and policies uh, with, uh, with an overall goal of uh, reviewing, revising and update the updating the policies and rescinding the ones that were no longer applicable. And in some cases, consolidating and bringing some of the other policies together. Um, in January 2021, a report came to Council, uh, which determined the actual report order and then broke it down into four phases. Uh, the first phase was your communities change and grow. The second phase was to be your government, your people. The third phase was your infrastructure, your services. And the fourth phase was your livable community. Um, earlier on in the year, we uh, and prepared a report um, and worked with planning and development to bring forward uh, a change in the policies and bylaws related to your community's change and growth. Um, we're now on to the second phase with this report, your government, your people. This report relates to IT and finance, um, and that will be presented today. Um, the next portion of your government, your people will be HR and administration. Uh, it's gonna come forward to council on June 9th. Um, your infrastructure, your services phase, which is uh, in part being led by Director Goheen and Director Kaza, uh, working closely with the clerk's uh, office, is uh, coming forward on July 14th. And I think we have uh, a kickoff meeting next week. Uh, in your livable community, which would be Director Lindsay, is planning on bringing that on August 18th. Um, so that's sort of a, a, the project in a nutshell um, that we're sort of, uh, that we started back in 2020 um, to today. So, and with that, I'll just ask if there's any questions. And and Anne, did I leave anything out? You can you can follow up on. Please do. Thank you very much for the summary. Is there any questions from committee members? I'll start with Councillor Hirsch this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't really have a question. I just want to make to comment about about this work. I, I've spent a large part of my professional career in drafting, revising, implementing policies and procedures so I know how much work this is. It doesn't look like that much when you see this on paper but you guys have been doing a tremendous job at, at going through this and I know we're only part way through but it, uh, I think the results are great so far so congratulations on what is really quite a, a major task. Second thing I'd like to say is that uh, it was very much appreciated that the IT uh, policies and some of the finance policies were brought to audit committee uh, for review. I thought that was quite appropriate. And um, I think we provided some useful comment back to staff, which which got incorporated in the final results. So um, so good on you for doing that. And uh, and that's all. I'm, I'm all in favor of what's proposed here. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hirsch, for your comment. Is there Councillor McNaughton? Uh, thank you. I, I, I would beg to differ with Councillor Hirsch. It looks like a lot of work to me. 
So um, I, I found it quite a lot of work just to read it through once. I haven't really um, sort of uh, fully thought everything through, and I'm going to reread it again. It bears a second reading. Um, but there, this week, there was a bit of a time pressure, uh, and I really do appreciate uh, what looks like a bit of a, a mountain to climb, and you've climbed it well, so thank you. I have one concern, very small concern about one policy, and it's on um, page 147, um, clause six, uh, which is page five of the um, IT acceptable use policy, and I'm just wondering, I, my thoughts about, so I'll, Hold on, I'll just get to it. Um, see if I can find it. It seems to relate to, hang on, my apologies because um, my highlighting is blocking out the phrase, unfortunately. Um, oh, it's okay, I'm deleting it, thank you. Uh, is the phrase maintain the confidentiality of electronic mail messages except where disclosure is required by law, I think is very suitable. Um, I feel like it's more focused towards staff because uh, it's already covered off in the council code of conduct with a bit more discretion to, um, because we have a responsibility towards transparency. And I believe that, that councillors conduct themselves on the whole with, um, with consideration of their responsibilities that includes discretion, but also, um, but also includes accountability and, uh, and um, transparency. So I, I feel like the way this is written here is more appropriate for <coughs> staff and uh, leaving the council code of conduct to um, understand their responsibilities uh, to help to guide council to understand their responsibilities under MFIPA and um, and uh, rules of confidentiality, I think would be um, sort of safer for us to not run afoul of the transparency principles that that have to guide us. So I would propose that, or, or I would ask, Anne, if it's appropriate to say that uh, in that in that section section. Um, that section, oh, I've just lost it again. Um, maintain confidentiality of electronic mail messages except where disclosure is required by law. That, that, that I would ask if it's more appropriate for it to say staff maintain the confidentiality of electronic mail messages except where disclosure is required by law. Uh, Anne or Director McNichol, would somebody like to comment? It's page 147 of today's agenda. Uh, section I don't, general B. V1 electronic mail B staff anybody uh, through the through the chair to uh, members of the committee um, I'll start I can't I can't seem to find it on my uh, uh, I, I just have it as page four here but I'll certainly take that into consideration it's I top, of page, five. top of page five it's um, Un under B yeah uh, basically, she wants to add the word staff and Director Carter. While they're thinking it over, I see your hand up, so I will uh, address you and you can speak. Hey, so Mr. Chair, to Councillor McNaughton, I would prefer not to because this policy is meant for anybody using any county equipment. So leaving it more generic allows for any other uses. So if we had a contractor come on board and they right. use a, a cell phone and had a mail message, um, that would cover us in that case as well. So I don't think it's meant to be yes. uh, as pointed as what um, you're suggesting. Thank you, Director Carter. Madam Clerk, did you have a, con I saw your hand go up for a split second at the corner of my eye. Through the chair, if I may, it's also important to remember that counselors do have a responsibility under MFIPA. So your council correspondence sometimes is not subject to MFIPA, we would not disclose it, but there are other times when you're acting as a officer of the municipality where your correspondence would be disclosed. So that clause does apply to council as well. 
But we're already required on, within our council code of conduct, we already have that requirement built in. So, uh, but the, through the chair, the council ahead. code of code of conduct does not sit in a vacuum as the only policy. You no. have to look at it with like a wider lens of how the council code of conduct relates to the IT policy and how it relates to MFIPA. So if they all work simultaneously, leaving the policy as it is just notes that it's applicable to all officers of the municipality, including councillors. Thank you. And I think we got the director Carter feels the same way. So unless you're looking to put an amendment on the floor to change that. Um, I will consider that for the council meeting to come okay. if, and, and work on it with staff to try to clarify that there's, there is a discrepancy, I believe, between the two and we'll work that out not okay. here necessarily. Is, that, is there any further comments on 6.2 on today's agenda? Not seeing any, so at this time I will call the vote. All in favor? And that carries. Thank you very much, and thank you, staff, for that report. Uh, 6.3. We have a re consideration request from Councilor McNaughton regarding bylaw 16 2022, the county's procedural bylaw section 5.11. So, Councilor McNaughton, I will turn the floor to you if you have a seconder to put it on the floor. Let's see if I've got a seconder. So, Thank you. Well, this is the reconsideration portion, and I would look to the clerk to, to guide this. Um, Sorry, I missed the second. Who is your seconder? I missed Jen, it. Jen, oh, Councillor Maynard had her Perfect. hand up, and I think someone else is. No followed. problem. Councillor Maynard, thank you. So, Councillor McNaughton, you're consulting with the clerk on steps. Yeah, so this is simply, I'm looking for a reconsideration of a motion that was placed during our procedural bylaw, or an amending motion that was placed during our procedural bylaw conversations to change some of the, to change some of the wording of uh, the section, the applicable section of the procedural bylaw that relates to um, having to make, uh, having to announce your um, intent to bring forward a motion at a future meeting, which I find uh, is is just um, uh, an additional and unnecessary step that doesn't particularly add any transparency and doesn't particularly uh, add much for particularly counselors who uh, might have a day job or um, don't have administrative support and um, I, I feel it adds nothing uh, aside from a good tip off for staff but I think that can be solved by being required to provide a written notice of motion a couple of days before the publication of the agenda so staff is aware and can work on the language to ensure that it is proper uh, and that the agendas themselves their release with the additional day that we have uh, added for them to come out in advance of a meeting adds, I think, adequate transparency. Um, I, as everyone knows, would prefer that those agendas be published a couple of days prior still, uh, but as it stands, uh, they come out on the Thursday prior to the Tuesday meeting. I think that gives ample time for the public to uh, begin to learn uh, about what's on the agendas, and it's equal time to the reports that have come forward. Um, so I'm, you know, hoping that uh, we can have a reconsideration. I'd like to know how people feel about it, if people feel that it adds value, uh, or if there might be a better way. Thank you, Councillor McNaughton, for your summary. Um, <coughs> is there questions for Councillor McNaughton or or commentary, I mean, we don't, we've talked about this not that long ago, so we don't, don't need to go on repeating what we talked about, but I will open the floor for a little questions or commentary right now. Councillor This Saint is Jean? just the reconsideration portion. Yeah. It's, it's a question on the reconsideration. Just. Yes, I am aware that my comments must be directly related to the reconsideration, the reconsideration and not uh, not the matter that may get discussed if the re reconsideration passes. Uh, I don't believe a re reconsideration is necessary. 
I think 5.11 is perfectly fine the way it is. And I would urge council members to remember that the ink is barely dry on this procedural bylaw. And I, I don't see the need to go tweaking it at this point. It seems to be working fine to me. I will not support the resolution, the, the motion to uh, reconsider. Thank you, Councillor St. Jean. Uh, any further comments before I call the vote? Nobody. All right. So I will now call the vote. All in favor of the reconsideration? I count five, Madam Clerk. So that fails. Thank you. Uh, we will now move on to section seven. The closed session. Could somebody please put us into closed session? Councillor Harper, Councillor Nyman. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Harper, Nyman, motion. The committee now move into closed session to consider A, advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose. B, a position, plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the municipality pursuant to section 239.2 F and K of the Municipal Act. Thank you, Councillor Harper. All in favor? And that carries. Madam Clerk, I will wait for you. So given that we're back on hybrid, uh, can you just all stay that and use this link?
welcome back to open session. We finished our closed session meeting. Uh, we have one motion arising out of our closed session meeting. Councillor Harper, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a Harper Margitson motion. The council received report OPS 09 2022. The council authorized the CAO to enter into an agreement with Ceramet Plant Limited for the non exclusive public use of the boat ramp and a designated parking area at 16057 Loyalist Parkway beginning in May 2022 for the period of one year with an option for a one year extension. Three, the council approved the expenditure of approximately $30,000 for improvements to the site to be funded from the municipal accommodation tax revenue. And four, the council approved an amendment to Schedule B to bylaw 75 2021 paid parking at boat launches to include the designated area at 16057 Loyalist Parkway. Thank you, Councillor Harper. Uh, all in favor? And that carries. Thank you very much. I'll now look for uh, number nine, motion to adjourn. Councillor St. Jean, Councillor McNaughton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is the St. Jean McNaughton motion that this meeting now adjourn at 2.38 p.m. And all in favor? And that carries. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of this beautiful day. Good job, Phil.